We're recording this on December 18th, 1995. We're talking with Dr. Ron Hall, who is the Associate General Manager of the Nebraska Educational Television Network and the manager of KUON-TV and professor of broadcasting at the University of Nebraska. Ron, let's talk a little bit about some biographical information first. Uh, tell us about yourself and how you got to Lincoln, Nebraska. Well, I was a person who was very interested in theater and was a speech theater major in college and all I saw was the bright lights of Broadway and I wanted to be there and while I, I did go to New York right after my graduation from from uh, college and I was there that summer and I got drafted in October while I was in New York and sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma where I went through everything that everybody else does and um, when I came out of basic training, they assigned me to special services. And I worked in the gym, Honeycutt Gym at uh, Fort Sill for, a, I don't know, a few weeks, handing out tennis balls and basketballs and stuff to people who were playing all these sports. And I just sat there in, the, in that room, you know, I, you know, the cage-like, and handed out this stuff. And one day, a person came over and said, uh, We've got to do a television program, a half-hour television program. The general wants this half-hour television program here at Fort Sill. It's going to be called Front and Center. And we've been looking at your background and everything, and what do you know about television? Well, I don't think at that point I even had a television set. I knew nothing about television. But I also knew I didn't like sitting in this cage at Honeycutt Gymnasium. And I said something to the effect that, well, you know, television is very related to the theater, and that's my bag. Well, I know quite a bit about television. So actually what they did, they gave me a chance to write a half-hour army variety show for them. And I didn't know the first thing about it. And I went to the phone and I called the TV station there in Lawton, Oklahoma, where we were doing this. And I, I just said, I have to write this script. What do I have to know? And the, the kid on the phone, I don't know who he was, but said, well, the script is divided in two parts. The video part tells what the camera's going to do, and down the right-hand side of the page are all the words. I said, okay, what do you tell, what about cameras? And he said, cameras pan, cameras dolly, cameras uh, um, tilt, and that's all cameras do. They either pan right or left, they dolly in or out, or they tilt up or down. And I thought, hmm, okay, and I wrote my first script based on that. And the major, who was more directly in charge, liked it. I wrote and was the, the host on that program for you know, about a year and a half, almost two years. I was in the Army almost two years. What was and, the station? Oh, uh, KSWO Lawton, Oklahoma. It was just a little station, but every I'd get a girl singer and the 89th Army Band and somebody who was just back from someplace around the world. And we'd do an interview and we would do a song or two in the band. What year was this? 1953 and four. Yeah. And then what it happened? It was great. Well, what happened was that uh, I never, it was the first time I got to a TV station, a studio. I remember it was counting on me to know everything. I'd never been in a TV studio before. <clears throat> but I came in the room, and you know, there are times when you just decide. And I said, well, we'll put the band over there. We'll put the set for the girl singer here. We'll put the couch here for the interview. And nobody questioned anything. We turned the lights on, and we did the first show. And we did 90, I did 90-some shows uh, there and knew that this really combined everything. It combined, you know, live action, drama, television, wide reach. It just had all the ingredients of something that I wanted uh, to do. That's what I wanted to do. So I did that and then I thought I better learn about this and I took a master's degree at Syracuse University who was giving a master's degree, they still do, in television. And um, so that, that's how I got that. Then when I graduated from Syracuse, I didn't have any job and I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I wanted California. I really wanted to go to California. I wanted Hollywood or New York, you know. But I got on a bus and I went to Denver 
and down to Amarillo and over to Oklahoma City and over to Little Rock and over to Memphis and to Atlanta and back up to Chicago. And along the way, I picked up uh, three job offers. Oklahoma City was one. Auburn, Alabama was one. My last stop was Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, I, I, I don't know if I was just tired. <laughs> you know, I'd never been to Lincoln, Nebraska before. But no, all the people that I met, uh, Jack McBride, of course, who started the station. George Round uh, had a lot to do with the station then, was one of the people that I had to interview. And I just liked these people really much. I felt very, very comfortable and good. It was the end of the road. And that was October 1955. Now, the station had signed on the air. KUON had signed on the air November the 1st, 1954. And so I came, uh, what, it's uh, when it was about 10 and a half or 11 months. About, it was, no, 11 months old when I got here. And that's... Uh, and Lee Rockwell is still in this building. He was one of the students at that time that helped. Uh, uh, Bill Ramsey was a student who was working, and he's, of course, the director of engineering. Uh, a wonderful community of people here who are trying to do the impossible with no money build. A, and at the, in those days, we called it an educational television station. We had some very far-sighted people here in Lincoln. Uh, Chancellor Clifford Hardin always has to be mentioned in that. Of course, Jack McBride, it was his inspiration and everything. He's the one that, that did it. But he had, he had wonderful assistance from Byron Dunn uh, at the National Bank of Commerce. Uh, Byron Dunn, you know, we didn't have any um, channel to use everything in Lincoln. There were two commercial stations, KOLN, which was at that time Channel 12, KFOR, which was Channel 10. And, uh, Mr. Fetzer, who owned uh, Channel 12, came in and he bought out KFOR and offered, and, and then took Channel 10 for his own station's designation and offered the university an opportunity for a VHF channel all their own, which was really wonderful. It was, it was enlightened uh, self-interest in a sense, but because of he created for himself uh, one station market for many, many years. But on the other hand, it was, a, it was really a wonderful thing to do, and the university was smart enough to pick them up on, on that. And that's really how KUON got started. Now, you mentioned Byron Dunn from the National Bank of Commerce. How he did he held fit the in this? He held that license while uh, the FCC was, was deciding whether or not they would change it from a commercial license to an educational license. And somehow he held it in trust during that interim period. How was that? handled as far as the university and Mr. Mr. Fetzer was concerned. Was he somebody who came forward or was that somebody who was designated, do you know? I'm not sure. What was, what was your title when you first came here? What were your responsibilities? Uh, let's see, I think producer director, but I was also in charge of uh, film and I wrote all the continuity, you know, continuity, all the, the space between programs, you write all that stuff. We had very, we had great limitations because uh, this was before videotape. We had no network, so that left us two options. We could either produce a program live in the studio or we could play a film, a 16 millimeter film. Those were our two options. Uh, we did all of this. Fetzer went even, even further. Uh, he allowed us to broadcast out of his station, uh, out at 40th and W Street. So they were operating the CBS station and this fledgling uh, university station out of the same control room. That used to be, I mean, if, if Channel 10 had a live show, like their cooking show, and if we had something back to back with them, the engineers had one minute to unplug the cameras from Channel 10, get them plugged in for Channel 12. All the audio equipment, unplug, put in. And, I, and there was more than one occasion when I would be sitting there ready to direct something, look up on the monitor and realize that uh, William Lundigan was selling Chryslers on the Climax program, which was a repeat in the morning, and they were carrying Ag Report 
on channel 10, you know, and things would get all screwed up. So every st the two stations would fade to black while the people would figure this out, plug it back in, and up it would come. We did that for three and a, about three and a half years. Total volunteer help. <clears throat> people like Bill Ramsey, Bob, Lee Rockwell. I'm sure there are others that are even still around, students who volunteered their time. Besides you and, uh, and Jack McBride, uh, who were the full-time employees at that period? At that period, uh, there were five of us. Jack was the general manager. The program manager was a fellow named Bob Slater, university graduate. Uh, the producer director after him called product the production manager was a man named Norris Heinemann. Then I was added as another producer director, and we had a secretary named Betty Soul. And there were five of us. Where were the offices? In Old Stout Hall, which no longer exists over there across the street from J School. Talk a little bit about Bob Schlater. Bob Schlater. Well, one of my really close friends. Uh, Bob was, well, he, he was a, a, a man from Oshkosh, Nebraska, whose parents moved him and his sister to Lincoln so they could go to a, a larger high school. As a lot of the ranching families did that, the mother would come to town and live with the kids. And, and uh, Bob was one of these kids. He was a very much a rah-rah fraternity boy. Fraternity was everything to him, and he really got into fraternity. He was also very much into the military. He was one of the people called back after the Second World War to go to Korea, and he did that, and then kind of had to start over when he came back from that. Uh, he had a wonderful spirit about him. I th he was a very popular guy here in Lincoln. Uh, about 1961, he was the program manager, and he decided that if he was going to stay with a university, any university, he needed a PhD. So he went to Michigan State University, got a PhD, and uh, eventually, not long after that, was the chairman of the television department at Michigan State University, and was in that position uh, almost literally just within a few years of his death. And he, he died at age 71, I think, or 70 about three years ago. But uh, he married a young woman uh, here that was in clothing and textiles, a very attractive uh, woman. And uh, he met her on one of the shows that we were doing in the basement. We had all these, <laughs> you know, a lot, all sorts of things were going on when we were producing back then. How about Norris Heinemann? Norris uh, was one of the, he was the first person that I met when I came to Lincoln, uh, Norris and Bonnie were from Ainsworth. Norris is one of the brightest people I've ever known. He graduated, uh, I want to say summa, it may have been magna, but cum laude from the University of Nebraska. He preceded me by a year at Syracuse University. And his very close friend from Ainsworth, a fellow named Bob Spearman, a really brilliant guy in broadcasting, uh, became a good friend of mine at Syracuse, and it was kind of through that connection that then I was aware of Lincoln, Nebraska. I was aware of the station just starting, and that sort of paved the way. But Norris uh, had a very, he was only 25 years old, and he got um, malignant hypertension. Not that you get it, but, excuse me, that developed malignant hypertension and the, the very high blood uh, pressure uh, ruined his kidneys, and we, as I say, we came here in October '55, and they were our best friends that whole first year. And um, my wife and Bonnie were very good friends. And Bonnie, that June, delivered a baby boy, and Norris was in the hospital at the same time because he was um, he was very ill. We didn't know how ill, but he had been in there for a few days, and. And so my wife was with Bonnie when she had the baby. And the OB was a good friend of both of ours. And when the OB delivered the baby, he said to, to Noni, he said, let's go over and tell Norris, you know, that he, let's go over to the other part of the hospital and tell him he has a son. It was like one or two o'clock in the morning. And so they went over there and we told Norris 
And then uh, Hod, the doctor, looked at his chart. He just looked to see, you know, what was wrong and what was being done. And he hung it back up and went out in the hall. And, and he said to Noni, he said, how old is this young man? And Noni said, well, he's 25. And he said, he won't see 26. And he, Norris, uh, we drove them up to Rochester for the last effort, in a sense. And, and then Bonnie flew him back here a day before he died. And that was July 13th, 1956. He died on Friday, July the 13th. And it was really a tragedy in our lives. It's always, it's always a tragedy when, uh, when somebody young is just taken like that. And I, I can't tell you how many times as, as Nebraska ETV has developed from you know, five-person staff to a 12-person staff, from nothing to a studio there in the basement of the Temple Building to a magnificent uh, telecommunications center on 33rd Street. And I've been so fortunate to enjoy all of that and see all the development. And I think of Norris so often. Norris was a lot better student than I ever was. Norris was probably a lot smarter than I ever was. I mean, he had all these attributes. And I think how unfair that is that, that he, that I got to do this and he didn't. I think of him very, very often and uh, think what, what he really missed, you know. It's, just, it's very sad to me. And of course, there's a scholarship that has been named. There is a scholarship that his mother perpetuates his memory all over all yeah. of the years since his uh, yeah. since his death. Which is about the best family. thing that people can do, I think. Uh, I've had people every now and then who will call and say they have some money and, and what should they do with it. And I know I should tell them to give it to public television, and we certainly do need it. But very often, depending on the person, I tell them to. If you really want it to be a living thing to help help young people come along, endow a chair if you've got that kind of money in some department, or set up a scholarship so that someone worthy is going to have that opportunity. Now, concurrent with some of these uh, pioneer folks who are here at the establishment of the uh, of the what was that? Concurrently with some of these folks who were yeah. here at the time, let's talk a little bit about. The facilities, we were talking about them still being at the Channel 10 location at 40th and W and doing the shows right. simultaneously and so forth. But at some point, the, the KUON TV then moved to its own facilities. 1957. The fall of 1957, we, uh, we had received $100,000, believe me, in 1957, $100,000. It was a lot of money. It's a lot today, but then it was everything. And we were able to remodel the old cafeteria in the basement of the Temple Building. And the biggest item that we were also proud of was that that cafeteria had two big poles in it. Well, we'd worked at Channel 10 where they had one pole, and that pole always became a chimney or a wall or it held something up. But there's that pole always right there in the middle of the studio. We were so tired of working around that we said, we're going to have a studio that has no poles. And by us, they took them out, put some beams across to give the building the support it had to have. And, um, and we converted that into a, a very functional, very nice little studio. We, we did some very good work out of that building. Who were, who were the people who were active in the design of that uh, of that location? I don't think I can tell you, Larry. I think they were university architects there. In consultation with you, the production folks? Yeah. Uh, Jack had, uh, I'm sure, much more to do with that. Than what was I your did. title in 1957? I was the program manager. Uh, no, I wasn't either. I was the, sorry. I was the production manager. Bob was still there. Then you succeeded Norris Heinemann. I, I succeeded Norris Heinemann. I felt badly about that, you know. It's, uh, but he was gone, and there it was, and that was it. But uh, yeah, I was a production manager, and but in those days, and we're getting back to that too. And that one of the most uh, important ingredients of public television is local production being that local place. Uh, almost all of communications in the country you know, are, are abrogating that. The local commercial stations do a fine job with local news, but that's about it. Nobody does long-form documentary anymore. In fact, there's no decent long-form documentary on the networks anymore. It's all mostly tabloid form uh, documentary. Uh, you've got Frontline on public television, which in my view is the only 
substantive investigative journalistic uh, documentary. And what we do, our best work here at Nebraska TV, uh, is the long form documentary. We have we have some wonderfully wonderful, brilliant producers who who do this uh, work that that I can hold up against anybody's work. When did you have to give up active work as a producer to be primarily an administrator? Well, I was going to say back in 57, we did about 24 live shows a week, which meant there were three of us, and we each did like eight shows a week. I mean, you just did them, that's all. I mean, I'm, we don't take, I don't take any great pride in that, except that... When you say there were three of you, who, who were the other well, two folks? Well, um, Bob Slater did his share, I... Uh, by that time, in, in this Temple studio, we had about 18 staff people, so we had added uh, a, a couple of people, a fellow named Lou Rhodes for instructional television, and, we, and Bob Dudley for instructional television, and Boyd Rooney. And, that's, and Boyd Rooney came, when Norris died, then uh, Boyd came, came along, and eventually, when Bob Slater left in 61, I took over program manager, and Boyd took over being production manager. And Boyd was with us until, I think, 1978 or 79, when he became the manager down in, in uh, Tucson, Arizona. So how long did, then did you continue to be the person oh. who actually directed the shows as well okay. as the Okay. I was still producing and directing up until I left, I went to Vietnam. I resigned from the university in May 1966. And up until then, I had done a, a number of, of series. Before PBS, we had an organization called NET, National Educational Television. I did two series uh, at that time in the early 60s for NET, that is with grant money from outside of, of the state of Nebraska. One uh, of those series is one to this, it, I still love it because I love the music of Charles Ives, but it was called Hinshaw Plays Ives. It was a four part, four half hours on the Concord Sonata by Charles Ives. And of course, Concord, Mass, Massachusetts is, is where uh, uh, Emerson and um, Oh, Louisa May Alcott and oh, Walden Pond. Thoreau. Thoreau, all of those poets and writers lived. And, and Ives wrote this small piece, uh, it's in four parts, I think it's in four parts, on those lives that lived there. And it's beautiful. And Harvey Hinshaw, professor of piano, and one of the finest exponents of Ives' music in the United States, was the pianist on the project, and we had a wonderful man named, named uh, Leon Lichner. Now, Leon Lichner was one of uh, America's very best uh, bass singers at that time. Leon had come to the University from New York where he had played the role of the saint in Manati's The Saint of Bleecker Street. Uh, if you remember back, uh, NBC used to do every Christmas, they would do a mall in the night visitor and Leon Lishner played Balthazar every year in that production. And I had an opportunity to meet, not too long ago, um, Giancarlo Minotti. And I mentioned Leon Lishner to him. And he's, he said, oh, is one of his best singers and we're apparently very good friends. So we did that series for NET. And then right after that, uh, I did a series called um, Land of Their Own, <clears throat> and it was a three-part series using the uh, primarily the Butcher Collection of Pictures of the State Historical Society, and it told three stories, you know, who came west, why they came. We documented all those sod houses, all the implements they used in the field, in the home, uh, and it was all based on diaries. Uh, the, land, the segment called Land of the Rhone, was, that was a three-part series. And the segment called Land of the Rhone was about the Oblinger family who came to Custer County in 1872. 
and the wife dies. It's a very touching, touching thing. It should be published as a book. In fact, Ken Burns, who's working on the West right today, is going to use some of the Odlinger letters in his show. But we would use, I would use three or four hundred still pictures in a program, dissolve, cut, dissolve, flip, cut, dissolve, at a time when um, we, didn't, we had videotape by then. That came in in 1959. But I was able, I was doing this, these flip epics at a time when we didn't, you had a half, you, it was a half hour show, you started, and at the end of the half hour, you were done. All of those pictures were on there, and it was painstakingly difficult. It really was hard work, and everybody in, out of the crew in the studio had to do it just split seconds. It was, we had three cameras, so it was cut, 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 and people were tossing pictures like mad. But it was wonderful. I, that, uh, that program was still very good. So I guess I quit producing. I went to Vietnam uh, because uh, I, I love foreign travel. I love foreign places. I've never seen a country I didn't like. And I'm sure that's true of most people. I think, I think everybody likes to travel. I, can't, I mean, there's something wrong with them if they don't. And, and, and just the other cultures and everything, you can feel at home so quickly any place, at least that's always been my discovery. And um, I had this, I had a friend in Washington, his name is Bob Squires. You know, Bob Squires is a hotshot political consultant now and he, he has managed the campaigns of Hubert Humphrey and really made it big time in Washington. And when I knew him, he was at USIA and I told him about my desire to work overseas. I wanted my family to have uh, a foreign experience. I wanted my kids to learn foreign languages and I wanted to afford them these kinds of things and I didn't have any money but this would be an avenue that you could explore. And so I, I took the uh, FS, uh, I went to FSI school in Washington, that's the Foreign Service Institute briefly, but I took, um, what do they call it? Well it's the Foreign Service exam, you know, where you take, I don't know, it's two days of written stuff and then they panel you and they bring in these Foreign Service officers and and then they question you and everything. And it's quite rigorous or something. And I was given an assignment to be the cultural affairs officer in Tokyo, which I thought was perfect. And we had our shots, we had everything ready, the whole family was ready to go, and I got a call from Washington saying that President Johnson had a different agenda, he had a different priority, and my qualifications fit exactly what the President was looking for, and I'm going, yes, yes. And I said, well, what is it? What is it? And, and I said, well, I'm going to Tokyo, right? I'm going to be cultural affairs office. Well, not exactly Tokyo. And they said, come to Washington. We're not going to tell you over the phone. I thought, well, I got on the plane and I went to Washington. And I remember sitting down and they said, the president wants to help the Vietnamese have television. They've never had television. And we want to build four TV stations in Vietnam. <coughs> Excuse me. And your experience and everything is just what we need. And so we want to send you to Saigon instead of Tokyo. I, I didn't know. I, well, I shouldn't say I knew where Saigon was, sort of. But I knew, and I knew there was a war going on there, because this was 1966. I mean, the build-up was just coming. I think the biggest troop build-up was. 66, 67. I think the largest number of five or six hundred thousand Americans were there then. And I said, well, well you know, well, where, where does my family live? Do they go to Saigon? Oh no, they have to go to a safe haven post. They go to Bangkok or they go to Manila or they can live in Hong Kong. <laughs> Never having been to those places. I said, well, uh, like how often would I see them? Well, maybe once a month, they said. I thought, well, oh dear. You know, and I had this decision to make and I didn't know what to do. And it was a terribly difficult decision because I didn't have to go anywhere. But you know, I had been in the Army and I told you about that. I was in Fort Sill. I never, was, I never uh, had to go any place where there was any fighting or anything. And I thought at the time, I thought, you know, maybe this time, maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. Maybe this is, I'm not going to get off of here scot-free. You know, I'm supposed to be someplace and work in a place like that. And you weren't asked to sacrifice before, so maybe that's, this is the time. 
so go ahead and do it. Now that was one of the reasons I did it, which you might put in a category of sort of patriotic in a sense, you want to do your part. The other part was just as real, and that was I didn't want to turn it down because I was afraid to go. You know? And all I knew about the Vietnamese War was that it was, uh, you know, every old lady carrying a basket may have a hand grenade and toss at you. It was that kind of a guerrilla kind of thing. And I really didn't want to face myself and figure, eh, you don't want to go because you're afraid you're going to get shot, you know, or something like that. So after I wrestled with that, I decided to go. I decided it was an opportunity like other opportunities. And uh, uh, I had a real, I had a rough time there for a while uh, when I first got over there. Everything was so different, you know, and and everything was so chaotic, and it was so hard to get anything organized. And um, but I have to tell you, it was an awfully good decision. I met some wonderful people there. I still correspond with, I still correspond with three families in Vietnam, um, uh, people that taught me so much. What were your responsibilities? I was the programming advisor to the manager, the Vietnamese manager of the TV station, and I was his programming slash production advisor. So my day started at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I taught English. At, they insisted from 8 to 9 every day. I didn't know, I'd never taught English, but fortunately AID has all these books. And, and I learned this overseas. If you can read, you can do anything. You know? So I took the book, here's how you teach English, and I read the teacher's guide every night and then go. I had 80 students uh, in the studio every, every morning, going down the line, you know, repeating over and over all the pronunciation, all the things, using the blackboard, of course, and all that. And that, that got us off to a good start because we, it sort of built a team. All the people that worked at the station, came and got the English first, and they knew they had to learn English. They knew they had to have that. And then uh, starting at, well, about 11, uh, no, no, about 9.30 in the morning, then I had, I had an interpreter. I had an interpreter till noon, from 8 till noon, and uh, we t I taught uh, production classes. You know, the, these guys had never seen television. They didn't know television at all. But dollying in and dollying out and panning left and teaching the directors. And uh, uh, it was a very laborious, painstaking. I remember at first I would be so frustrated because it's very hot in Vietnam during the dry season. And about 12 noon, I lost everybody because they lie down on the floors, on the piano, under the piano. Everybody took siesta. It was something I wasn't used to. I used to run around and say, come on, your country's falling down. Now get up and get to work. But they said, but in Vietnam, we, we rest now from 12 to 2. And I, I couldn't believe it, but they did. And, and then later I got, so I'd like to just lie down to, you know, when in Rome. And, it, and that worked, because we worked till 8 or, eh, about 8 o'clock at night. And we produced television programs. Now the only third country programs, if we didn't, everything had to be in Vietnamese. That was one of the dictums. But, but about what, 10 or maybe 10 or as much as 15 percent of the Vietnamese population had French language and were really Francophiles who loved French, uh, France. France, of course, had been there since, well, for a couple hundred years, but really officially since about 1890. They had been in control in Indochina. And uh, so we did show some French entertainment films. The Vietnamese liked those, but otherwise, all we broadcast were what we produced. And it was the army show, naturally. We had a news show every week. The most popular shows we did in Vietnam were what is called Kai Lung. And Kai Lung is the, um, the Vietnamese opera. It's, they're like Chinese operas. Uh, you really have to get a Westerner, and the Western ear has to get used to these operas. And they, they go on for, well, four to six hours. And we used to take a whole day, you know, or maybe two days to tape one of those operas. We'd show two hours Thursday night, and two hours Friday night, and two hours Saturday night. I promise you, they're just like people in Nebraska. 
They love those old stories that tell them who they are as a people, tell about their victories, tell about their defeats, tell about the kings, tell about the princesses and the romances. That's what those stories do. And whole sections of Saigon used to blow out fuses and everything because of all the TV sets that would be, turn, be tuned in to, to that kind of I, I saw there you know, the power that, that that is. And you know that's really true here. And we raise a lot of money on, on television. And all, so often, if it's a program, a documentary about who came to Nebraska and settled it, and why did they come here, and what were they like, and who had preceded them, and what have they accomplished, and what did they give you, the new generation? Uh, those stories, I mean, phone rings off the hook right now. People love that. When I went to Washington uh, in 1982, 1982 to be the director of the uh, program fund for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. There I managed a $40 million pot of money to give to producers for public television and no one could countermand my decision. That's the way it was set up at that time. It isn't true anymore, but that's the way it was then. And at my first interview with the board, before I was hired, one of them, uh, Jeff Cowan, who is um, Father Les Cowan had been president of uh, CBS, and Jeff is Jeff is head of Voice of America today in Washington. But Jeff said, uh, "Mr. Hall, if you were given some extra money, what new service, what programming do you feel uh, the American people aren't getting? Where's the gap? What, where aren't we serving them?" And it was real easy for me to just say like that: history, history, people. I've said it, you know, they, they, are, they are interested in their forefathers and who they are, their identity. We're all interested in that. I said, if I had the money, I'd start a history series. And everybody goes, hmm. And I remember one of the board members said, oh, you'll probably do the story of Thomas Jefferson and you'll spend all your time talking about his mistress, a black slave. And I said, well, that may be a part of that. But if we do Jefferson, it'll be done in a scholarly way about Jefferson. Oh, I'll bet. You know, well, we had we had different kinds of people on that board, and uh, took me, I think it was three years. I mean, to accumulate the money. Finally, was able to put together a package of cash, which amounted to gosh, I think it was three three. It was at least three million dollars, and I went to Boston. Well, actually, I called a meeting in New York with with uh, Hugh Price out of uh, WNET Channel 13 in New York and um, the fellow in Boston, the most brilliant guy there, and I'll just have to think of his name, he's, he's a wonderful, he's still there, he's wonderful. And he's the one that shapes the programming that comes out of Boston. But I said, I would like to, I would like you guys to start a history series. I won't tell you how to do it, but I would like to have you do it together. These are the two behemoths in all of public television who rarely spoke to each other. And I really feel, I feel at every level that the taxpayer deserves to have people in the public sector communicating, figuring out efficiencies, non-duplication of effort, etc. I feel we owe that to people. And this is where I was coming from with this. And um, they both said, well, naturally, it was $3 million there. And then they went to the stations, and the stations put up uh, another $3 million. And what resulted from that was The American Experience, which is on the air. It's a wonderful series. Uh, the reason I feel that history is so good is that no matter where you live in the United States or the world, there are people that have stories, you know, no matter where. And so it's not only stations telling the stories, independents, uh, producers can tell those stories. The, the series, the credit for the series belongs to a woman named Judy Crichton, the producer who came along and shaped it. And, and, it's, and it's her standard uh, that everyone has to measure up to on that series. And, and that's really why it's so good. But I've always been pleased that I was a part of that. I gave them the money, you know. And the, and the money is very important or nothing happens with the money. Ron, you've had a lot of different kinds of experiences uh, beyond the Nebraska. Um, before we get past the, the Vietnam situation, yeah. When did you come back from Vietnam, and what were your subsequent experiences with Vietnam as well? Oh, well. You were there in '66, starting. I was there out. in '66. 
And we started that station. Um, we didn't have a tower to broadcast from. Uh, so in lieu of a tower, do you know what a Connie is? An old Constellation airplane? Do you remember what that shape was? It had a, it had a beautiful, graceful body. Four-engine airplane. Uh, if you remember the old uh, the, the television experiment over Indiana, Illinois. In Patty. In Patty. We used their airplanes. Those were those Connies that had been reconfigured with a television TV transmitter sticking out the bottom of the belly to broadcast programs. And we had a couple of um, RCA videotape players. We even had a 16 millimeter film player. We even had a little two-seater thing with a camera there with a couple of lights in the plane so that you could do live breaks, you know. Well, we hope you enjoyed that program. Now coming up right now, we're going to have industry on parade, and not industry, something in Vietnamese, in the airplane. And then the airplane would go up and fly over Saigon at 10,000 feet and broadcast as many hours of programming as we had gotten done that day, which meant at the most three hours. If we could get three hours done in a day, we just worked our little behinds off getting, getting that work done, and then we would go out to Tanzanut and get on this Navy-operated uh, airplane. And the problem with the airplane was that when you were taxiing down the runway, the VC were always shooting <laughs> at you, you know. And to compensate for that situation, uh, you'd get on the plane, the first time I got on the plane, I sat down, I strapped up, they hand me a bulletproof vest, I put the bulletproof vest on, ties in three little places and little bows, it's kind of funny. And before we took off, one of these young men, one of these Navy guys came over and he said, uh, why did you put that vest on? And I said, well, it, I thought that's what I was supposed to do. And he said, no, you're up in the air. He said, we sit on them. And so, they, so if the bullets come from the ground up, I said, oh, okay. So we sat on them. But what they did to keep the VC from having too much opportunity to shoot at you, they would go down the runway just as fast as they could and get the plane off just <laughs> up. You were lying on your back with your feet on the ceiling, quite literally, just that huge airplane going right up in the air as fast as it could get there. Then the converse was just as bad, and that was coming down because it would get right over Saigon and at 10,000 feet, and suddenly the whole nose would go down and we go right straight to the ground to cut down that angle that people could shoot at you. And uh, well, that was exciting. Now this was 1966? 66, 67. Uh, I left there. I was there a year. And I left Saigon and came back. Uh, Jack McBride, bless him. Uh, actually, you know, it's funny. I was offered a really good job at EEN, the Eastern Educational Network, while I was in Vietnam. And uh, as the program director of the Eastern Educational Network, it was a very fine position in Boston. And I decided I had, I had to take that job. I mean, if I wanted to get ahead in my field and everything, I still remember I, I typed my letter up accepting the position. Dan, a man named Don Quayle was uh, the head of it at that time, and he was the one that offered me the position. I got the letter typed, and I got out on, I, I left the Astor Hotel where I was living, and I was walking up Tudo Street to go over to uh, Mui Lam Tisak. Mui Lam is 15 Tisak Street where the studio was. And you know, you get in those streets and you look, you look at the people, wonderful people who have nothing. I mean, sleeping in doorways, little kids, street urchins. I mean, every place you looked, there was need. And I, this was like in January, and I'd only been there six or seven months, and I thought, I can't leave yet. I mean, I really can't leave the station yet. I've got to stay here at least a year. And I, I remember going on up to the post office and tearing up the letter of acceptance and sending a cable saying, sorry, but I just can't leave. And I didn't. And uh, so I, I saw the year through, and but in the meantime, uh, Jack was able to create a position for me, which was really 
a position as his assistant, and that was 1967. So simultaneously with coming back, I also decided that if I was going to be connected with the university, I ought to have the doctorate. So that fall of 67, I started to school and then started to work uh, back with ETV. And uh, we were just then finishing, I think in 1968, the network was complete with all the towers. We had a nine-station ETV network. And then the next uh, plot that Jack had, of course, was a new building. And it was in the next couple of years then that I was deployed I spent part of every day, this was back when the legislature only met every other year, and so they were long sessions, and I was up there every day for nine months uh, lobbying. Jack would plan the strategy, and I would read it, go over it, and I would call on the senators. What year was this? That, I think, was 69. I believe it was 69 that they... And what was your title at those days? Oh, I think I was... I think I was assistant to the manager, I think. I, was, I think so. Uh, I think that's right. But I'll never forget. <laughs> you know, lobbying is, is uh, nerve-wracking work. You know, one slip of the tongue, and you alienate uh, one of those 49 people, and you're out. And so I was very conscious <laughs> of 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 this role, and we had people like Terry Carpenter up there, and Ernie Chambers was there then, and Jerry Warner, and lots of lots of great people were there too. But I remember the first day I got up there, I didn't know anything about anything about how to lobby. I was just supposed to go up and start talking to people about having this new telecommunications building, and I ran into Dick Herman, you know, one of the editors of the Lincoln Journal, a columnist. And he, I pretty much said, Dick, you know, we we want to get this building. Well, how much is that going to cost? Well, about three million dollars. Well, you'll never get it through this session. I mean, this year things are really tight. You know, they're always really tight, but this year they're really tight. And I said, Oh, what am I going? What should I do first? He said, Well, if I were going to go after something that big, I'd go talk to the governor and see if he's going to veto it. If you have any luck at all, Nobby Teeman was the governor. So I went and got an appointment that morning. That's one thing I love about living in Nebraska. You can be very close to your government if you want to be. You can go in. Anybody can. You go in there and say, I'm so-and-so. I'm from Murray, Nebraska. I'm from Fillmore County, whatever. I'd like to see the governor in just a couple of minutes. The Nebraska governor, you know, I mean, have, you may have to wait around for an hour or something, but he'll see you or she'll see you. And that's, that, well, this was Nobby. And that morning, I got in and he said, well, what's on your mind? And I said, we really have to have this educational telecommunications center, and we're going to start now working with the legislature, and we're going to, we, we are really going to do this. But if we do it, and if we get it passed, will we have your blessing on us? And he was so surprised. I, he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, will you veto it if, if, you know, if we're successful? And he looked at me, he said, wow, no, I don't think I'd veto it. If you can do that, he said, I don't think I'll veto it. I said, great, that's all we have to know. So I went out in the hall, and then from then on, it was working. They, they passed, the, they had first given us a planning grant, you know, to, to study the situation and to come up with a design. What year was that? Memory fictionalizes, uh, I think, uh, um, yes, I think that was 68. And then it was 69 that we actually went after the, <clears throat> the uh, construction money. And, uh, and we got it. In uh, August, they passed a bill. What was the strategy? Well, for one thing, we were uh, teamed up with Terry Carpenter. The strategy was based on... Uh, the fact that we now had this wonderful nine-station network, and the state had done that. And it was an expensive undertaking to build nine transmitters out across the state. But we didn't have any way to produce software, the programming. The most important part of any television operation 
It's what you put out there. What's on that screen? What are people going to see and hear? And uh, Terry, uh, early on, came on as an early proponent of, of ours on this. And of course, his power was enormous. I have to tell you, um, he got very angry with us and withdrew his support after the legislation was passed in 1969 and the building was being constructed. In fact, when it was 70% complete, he called one day and he was just livid that some professor, and I don't remember what department, I don't know if it was the English department, I don't remember, some professor was starting a homophile study course. You know, the study of homosexuality. And Terry was adamantly opposed. And he called me up and he said, we had a remote truck, and he said, I'm going to have a hearing on this in Omaha, and I want you to bring that truck to Omaha, and you televise it on the state network, and we're going to get to the bottom of this. And I said, well, what date? And I looked at the date, and I said, I would love to televise this because every single human being in the state of Nebraska is their interest is going to be piqued about this subject, and you, and uh, I'd love to do it. But I said, you know, you know something? We have been working now for a month with the drama department. The drama department was doing Julius Caesar, and they were doing it in some very original ways. And we had agreed to televise this. They it was quite experimental, but when the audience showed, showed up at Howell Theater, there were Roman soldiers, spears, all the regalia, that marched the whole audience then from Temple Theater over to the sculpture garden of Sheldon Gallery. And the first scenes of Julius Caesar took place outside. It was at night, but lighted. And this was terrific, and the kids were terrific, and we had worked on this. And that's when it was going to be done, that day. And I said, Mr. Car Senator Carpenter, I do it any other time, but I, can't, I cannot not do this. We can't let these kids down this way. And you know what he said? You'll be sorry. And he threw the phone down. And oh, you know, this is one of those times when your stomach just goes in a concave fashion. And... Uh, it was in January, one of the first things in January, he had had a bill drafted which would take the ETV, the new ETV center, away from us and uh, it would be converted to be a new law school for the University of Nebraska, which was another push the law school was really trying to, to get a building also. And Terry had the architects come into our building, the one we are in at this moment, to determine what the non-recoverable costs would be in uh, reconfiguring this, like our magnificent Studio One over there. They were going to put in a second, divide it, uh, make it two-story, and that would be the law library. I have to admit, it would make a great law library. But we had to go back and fight the whole battle uh, right straight through again with him, and uh, fortunately, we won that. The, the legislators saw the wisdom of maintaining the course. And like, and with Terry, too, you never know what his ploy was. He often voted against things because he knew that that would get people to vote for something. So you, we, you never really knew. It scared the daylights out of us anyway. And, but we did get what we wanted. And the building, of course, is the Terry Carpenter Telecommunications Center. So it all, that all turned out pretty good. What was the turning factor when the fight was refought that the legislature decided not to take the building back? You know, I don't think I can reconstruct that except except that we had so much support at that time. George Gertis was there. And, you know, George Gertis really is one of the princes who saw the value of extending education the way a good land-grant college or university does, to give back to the people what they already own, they already have their vested interest in. 
he was one of those leaders. And during that time when we had to refight the battle, I think our support was pretty steady. Why, why was the strategy to involve Terry Carpenter to start out with? Well, uh, Terry was formidable. And I think most people felt that you had to have Terry on your side to get most major things done. There was another factor, and that was that, uh, see, Terry fought us uh, when we were building the network because Channel 13 out of Alliance, he had his eye on Channel 13 to develop himself for a commercial enterprise, and he could have. That was a VHF channel out there available. And, and the turning point with him, I remember when he came into Jack's office one day and said, that you're not going to bring that educational crap to my part of the state. <laughs> and I was sitting on the other side of the petition, in those days we didn't have walls, we just petitioned, whoa, this guy means business, you know. But, uh, in a sense, fortuitously for us, Terry had a mild heart attack and was advised not to get involved in developing a commercial station and not to expend that kind of energy. And so when he realized that he shouldn't do that, then he didn't want the competitors out there to have it either. And at that point, he became a player with us and said, this would be a great thing. We can, and, it ha and that was one of the remaining pieces of the network. How did the building get to be named the Terry Carpenter Building? There was a resolution uh, by the unicameral. When? Well, the building was dedicated June 1972. So I, I, I would assume it would be that session uh, before that time in 72, I think. I had the pleasure of bringing Terry through the building the first time. Picked him up. I used to have to take him to lunch a lot. And we never had any budget to take anybody to lunch. And Terry was a millionaire. And I used to sit there at the pancake house and these places that we would go in those days. And I'd say, I'm paying for this guy's lunch, <laughs> but he would just get up and walk away. He never paid for it. Why would he pay for lunch? You know, and which is fine. And I, I have good feelings about Terry Carpenter. I thought he was a brilliant, brilliant man. I think, uh, I think he could have been a really great man if he had been a little more constant, a little more consistent on certain things. Uh, nobody was smarter than Terry Carpenter. And Terry used to say, you know, the next smartest guy in this place. Next to me is Ernie Chambers. He's the next smartest guy. And it's probably true. They're both brilliant people. And uh, I have a lot of respect for Terry. He gave us fits. But you know, I just right here at the level I work at now, the producers, they give me fits. <laughs> are the, they're the best. <laughs> you always get the best work out of people that have this vision of their own. And nobody else can tell them how to do it. And they're going to do it their way and no other way. And that's where you really get wonderful work, and you have to give people the freedom to do that and to go out and create. And that's really the joy of working in a place like this and having the opportunity to be with people like that. How many years did you spend working uh, as the uh, assistant to uh, Jack? To the Jack before you resumed the program? Oh, uh, let's see. I finished. Let me think. I finished my doctorate. Graduated in January 1970, and the program manager that Jack had hired when I went to Vietnam, a fellow named Bill Oxley, uh, resigned and took a position with KCET in Los Angeles. Later uh, was a head of, or I think head of programming at PBS. He had a high programming position at PBS uh, for a while. Uh, he resigned and as soon as that happened then Jack just turned that title over to me and I went back and I think that was 1970. I think it was congruent with when I got my doctorate. I remember I was all through and ready to take up and we had the building in place and everything was that was all ready. And so just to, to put this in, in perspective, a period essentially from 1967 when you returned from Vietnam through the, this particular period was the area in time which you spent Primarily working in the non-programming administrative absolutely. aspect, absolutely, and working yeah. primarily on getting the uh, support. Oh, for well, the a whole bunch of things that Jack had going, but the the building was big, and and uh, he had me to deploy up there all the time. Okay, Ron, we're coming about to the end of uh, an hour tape mm. at this point, so we're going to stop the tape at this point, and then we'll resume in a moment. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.
We're, we're, we talked earlier about the uh, construction of the uh, Nebraska Educational Telecommunications Building, the yeah. Terry Carpenter Building, 1800 North 33rd Street in Lincoln on the University of Nebraska Lincoln East Campus. Yeah. You mentioned that the building was dedicated in 1972. What did that building mean for the development of Nebraska Public Television? Well, <clears throat> both psychologically and uh, and just realistically, it brought a completeness to what we were doing. I mean, it gave us a head. Before, we had this wonderful distribution system to get materials out there to schools, colleges, homes, but we didn't have this centralized place to produce materials. And uh, I think I mentioned to you earlier that some of the best work that we do here are the long-form documentaries about our people and our history. And that made this possible. We, we couldn't do it without that. What was the level of the production facility at that time in comparison to other public television facilities around the I country? I think at the time, uh, I think it was as good as anything that existed uh, in all of public public television and in uh, and, and most of commercial television. I, I'm sure that of course, you know, we've had, I, when we were doing Anyone for Tennyson, we, and we worked with so many, particularly Hollywood people, Vincent Price and uh, you know, Henry Fonda. Uh, William Shatner. William Shatner. But I remember when uh, uh, Price had been in umpteen Hollywood movies. He walked in our studio, and he said, oh, oh, this is beautiful. He said, you know, I'm used to working in places where the dust is four inches deep, and they were built back in the 20s and the 30s, and they were all falling down. And all those sound stages, that's quite true at RKO and Columbia and Fox and MGM and all that. What was the intent and the design of the building at the time? What was it supposed to be able to provide in terms of a production facility? The size of the studios, the offices, why was it designed the way it was? Well, uh, we, had a, we had set our sights high. The size of the studio, for example, was to encompass dance, orchestra, uh, drama. Uh, and we have used that whole studio on many, many occasions. When we were doing Anyone for Tennyson, for example, there were, uh, when we did the Lord Byron and Keats and Shelley programs, uh, the studio became a magnificent ballroom. People were, uh, were amazed that uh, you know, we had that kind of facility in Nebraska. I, I still think that 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 facility, that sound stage is n no doubt the best between, I would say, uh, Chicago and maybe the West Coast. I don't think there's anything better. And I would say that that studio and these facilities that Jack and, <clears throat> and the architects and well, all the staff that worked, worked on it, Boyd Rooney worked on it a great deal. Uh, the vision that they had, I would say that this facility is still one of the strongest assets we have. Because as you know, public broadcasting is, is in for some lean times. At least the, the federal funding, is uh, we believe, will be gone by the year 2000. And one of the reasons that Nebraska is so well positioned is that it has this production. We can, we can produce anything here. We can produce anything. We have that capability. And that's what it's all about. If we produce it for cassette sales, we produce it for cable, produce it for network television, for PBS, it doesn't matter, but we're going to be able to produce it. And I think that was the vision that was there even then. As an example of, of uh, programming, talk a little bit about in, anyone for Tennyson. You yeah. talk about it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Put in a couple of paragraphs so the people who view the about anyone for Tennyson? tape can, can know what that was. Anyone for Tennyson was the first poetry program on PBS nationally first poetry series. There was there always been some poetry done, and Julie Harris did a couple of things. <clears throat> and uh, later, after that, there was a, a very fine poetry series done. But Anyone for Tennyson was a very simple premise to take the great poetry of the world. And we cast four very attractive young people, two men and two women. They were called the first poetry quartet. And they were all actors out of New York, and they were all very, very good. And then we brought with them a guest star each time. And for example, we did Poems of the Sea. We shot that at Mystic Seaport in Connecticut. Uh, we did poems of, uh, I think it was Poems of the West that Henry Fonda did for us. Um, Irene Worth did Wordsworth. We went to England and uh, 
did a, a beautiful show on, on Shakespeare and some of the sonnets. Um, oh, Vincent Price did a program on food and art. So we developed themes. What years was the program in progress? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm going to take it. Anyone for Tennyson began, I believe it was, I believe we started in 1975. We did it for three seasons. Over a period, a period of three years, we produced 50 half hours. And at that time, the stations had to ratify by their voting a certain amount of money towards the production of a program to ensure that other public televisions. All the stations in the country had that chance. The program manager would vote whether or not they wanted it. And we were able to sustain that for three years. I remember Bill Perry, and he was the creative person behind that series. Uh, he had come to me and uh, said, I have this idea about a poetry program. And, and interestingly, uh, he said, I think the thing that triggered it for me, he says, I said, I'm thinking of calling it Anyone for Tennyson. And I remember when I was in high school, I was a senior in high school, and I was going with a girl named Elaine, Elaine Hansen, someone I liked very much. She was a junior. And I had just been reading Tennyson's Idols of the King. And if you remember, there's a beautiful idol called Lancelot and Elaine. And the first lines are Elaine the fair, Elaine the lovable, Elaine the beautiful, Elaine, the lily maid of Astolat. And I used to go through the halls of Rhapsody High School <laughs> just following Elaine with this, you know, which at that time she didn't appreciate all that much. But uh, as soon as he said that, you know, it just triggered, and I thought, well, I have to listen to this. And then he had this idea and he expounded on it. <clears throat> and I said, we were very interested in doing that. And then we did it for three years. I remember Bill and I went to WNET in New York thinking we might pave the way with PBS better if we were doing this in cooperation with a big gun like New York. And I will never forget the executive in New York saying to us, when uh, we decide there should be a poetry series on television, we'll do it. This is before we got our little show off the ground. And I've always taken great pleasure. WNET refused to carry it the first year because of that very same attitude. And I browbeat them and browbeat them until they finally put it on Saturday afternoons. And I had the pleasure one time to be in my hotel room in New York and turn it on, and there we were. <laughs> Let's continue in the discussion of the <clears throat> 1970s and talk about some other folks. Uh, for example, there were some people who were commercial broadcasters in Nebraska at that point, Howard Stonecker, Jim McGaffin, Bud Pence, Roger Larson, people on oh, those Bud lines. Pence. Talk a little bit about those folks and their interaction with the Nebraska Public Television. Well, you know, for so long, uh, our, some of our, the people that were really against us the most were the commercial broadcasters. They tended to be the smaller radio station broadcasters who really saw educational television as a direct threat to their livelihood. <clears throat> Although that had never been proven any place else in the country. You know, Nebraska was one of the very last states to get public radio for that same reason. There was so much resistance to this. <clears throat> but over time, the larger stations, um, WOW, KMTV, uh, KETV, they really helped us a lot. I mean, they cooperated with us on a number of things. We used their talent on different things. Uh, and Howard Stonecker, for example, was a member, was appointed by the governor to be on our commission. Bud Pence, one of the great living characters of Nebraska who owned Queeby Radio down in Beatrice. Wonderful man. He had so much spirit and life. He was on our on our commission for quite some time. <clears throat> I think he only got off when the Nebraska passed the Sunshine Law that you had to disclose your sources of income and everything. And he had nothing to hide, I'm, I'm sure, but he just didn't like the principle of it, of the government having to know, and he, he left. But I've always respected him. And I've always enjoyed a friendship with him. 
I was on the board of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association for about six years and enjoyed that very, very much. Uh, well, I had worked out at Channel 10, and Jim Ebel, a longtime manager out there, wonderful man, wonderful engineer, a, very, a man with a lot of compassion for other people. So I, I, had, I had worked for him on Saturdays to make extra money. I directed at Channel 10. I did Wayne West's Juvenile Theater, and I did the 10 o'clock news and the 6 o'clock news on Saturdays. I used to do it. Was you a, directed those shows. I directed all of those shows. The, or one in the, in the early morning, too, on Saturdays. I used to get $10 for whatever I directed. Like I'd go, usually I directed three things on Saturdays, so I made $30 on Saturdays. And I got to tell you, in the 60s, with four children, 30 bucks made a big difference. It did. And Jim Ebel was always very nice to me, and he was always involved in that. Uh, KFOR, who. Uh, Roger Larson, Dick Chapin. Well, Roger Larson, I think the world of it. Dick Chapin <clears throat> was. Uh, Roger Larson was also on the TV commission one time. Yes, he was. Oh. That's right. Yeah. But uh, we enjoyed a good relationship with them. Then, for line, you were the president of the NBA, and we've always had a. a in, in recent years, we've had quite a positive relationship with the broadcasters. And Larry Rice up at uh, Ainsworth has always been very supportive of us. In fact, one time when I was through Ainsworth, I used to have committees around the state, and I stopped in Ainsworth, and he said, uh, well, come on on, let, let me interview you. We'll just do an interview about public television. And I said, well, fine. And he said, well, let's just open this up for calls. And I said, fine. And my guys, the people called in. It was just wonderful. You know, he owns this radio station up there. He can do anything he wishes. The funniest thing that ever happened to me, though, with, was with uh, Bud. Bud asked me to come down to... Beatrice and be on Queeby Radio and talk about educational television, public television. And I did. It was just a half hour interview. And the program that followed was another live thing that they did every day that had a telephone call in with people. But when I left the station, Bud said, Well, listen to Queeby on your way back to Lincoln now. It's this number and everything. And you listen to Queeby. And I said, Well, I will. I'll go out in the car and I'll just set her on Queeby and I'll listen to you all the way back. And in, I don't know, about 20 miles out of town, I was listening to Bud, and a lady called in, and she had a question about educational television. She said, now that man that was on before, and he said such and such about educational television, is I'd like to know, and Bud didn't know, and Bud said, Ron, are you listening to this? If you're listening, now right off the road, at such and such a juncture, there is a pay phone booth right there. Our number is this. He gave me the number, and I, and I remember driving along thinking, he's talking to me. You know? And I thought, only in Nebraska, because I got out and put the quarter or whatever it was, I called the station, I heard me on the car radio answering the lady's question and got back in the car and I thought, it's wonderful to live in a place like Nebraska where, you know, we're all related. We all, everybody in Nebraska knows each other or is related to each other in some way. It's wonderful to live in a society like that and I really appreciated that. Moving into the 1980s, however, you decided to leave Nebraska for a while. Right. Talk about, talking about uh, uh, leaving the, the uh, Nebraska Public Television and spending some time in, in uh, the nation's capital. Well, you know, by that time I had been here since, uh, except for the, the year I took off to go to Vietnam, I had been here since 1955. Uh, I do believe that... What year is this now? 82, when I left for Washington. I really believe that people have to take advantage of opportunities. You can't invent opportunities. You can do a lot to help create your own opportunities, but then when one comes along, then you got to decide. You're either going to do it or you're not. And I am a person I've never wanted to ever... I don't know what the, what's the saying, only people that don't have regrets are the French singers. <laughs> you know what they say about no regrets. We all have regrets, but I don't want to have regrets. And uh, I thought, you know, that's an opportunity. That's Washington. That's... Big time, in a sense. But the thing about it was, I, I can give you the recipe of how to get a job that really works. And that is, don't care if you get it. Don't even want it. Don't pursue it. If they're interested, fine. It works. People can't stand that when they have somebody. They don't, they're not just lusting after this job. <clears throat> because I, I got a call from a, a headhunter, a search firm, 
They said, Mr. Hall, we're looking for someone to, to uh, replace Louis Friedman. Now, Louis Friedman was a, is a big icon in television. He produced um, the Andersonville trial, which at the time was got the a Emmy for the best uh, drama on television, with William Chatner, in fact. And he was the first director of the program fund, this autonomous person who could make these decisions about who gets the money. Uh, it was a big new idea that came uh, from a man named Robin Fleming, the former president of the University of Michigan, who is now the Corporation for Public Broadcasting president. Uh, not president. Uh, yeah, president. Right. He was the president of the company. And it was his idea to vest this power in one person so that a presidentially appointed board couldn't politicize the programming process and have any influence over this person. So this meant that you had this person at the corporation who had far more power over money than even the president of the corporation and controlled more money than anybody else. But everybody bought into that. That was a democratic idea that came out of the uh, Carter administration days, Carter appointees who put that in place and at that time most of the board were Democrats. <clears throat> well, Lewis, and I think Lewis even said, I never keep a job longer than two years. I mean, that was like Lewis. Um, he, he, he had a lot of flip, he was a wonderful man, a brilliant man. He did a lot for public television. He invented, uh, he started the Frontline series. He started, um, oh gosh, it was his idea to create these major series that we still have. Uh, of the major series, I've already told you about the one that I was able to start, and that was after Lewis. But that idea was Lewis's idea. And I got a call, and they said, you know, Mr. Friedman has resigned, and I had read that. I knew him. I had gone to China with him and others. Uh, about seven public broadcasters were invited uh, by the Chinese, by the U.S.-China Relations Committee to go to China for three weeks. <clears throat> and Lewis was on that trip, and I was on that trip. There was, as I said, seven of us, so I knew him. And the voice, voice on the phone said, uh, you've been suggested to replace him. Well, I had never in my wildest imaginations even thought of it. And I was in Colorado on vacation, and I said, well, what, what do you want me to do? Oh, no, that's not true. They called, they said, could we, would you, we'd like you to submit your name. And I said, well... I guess I don't have anything to lose, I'll send you my resume. And they said, well, we don't have time to do that. The deadline is nigh, and uh, would you, if you don't mind, could we take it down over the phone? And I thought, well, that's strange. Read my resume to somebody over the phone. But I did. I sat there, I read the pages of, of resume, and uh, hung up and really didn't think anything about it. Then I was on vacation in, the, in Colorado, and I got a call from CPB, and it was from their personnel office. And the man said, uh, well, Mr. Hull, we, we got this resume from this company, but I just want to tell you, we never hired a search firm to do this. And I said, well, fine, forget it. And he said, well, we don't want to forget it because Mr. Fister, the pres Ed Fister was president of CPB, and Mr. Fister saw your name in the list and he'd like to talk to you. And I said, no, I've known Ed forever. Tell Ed he doesn't owe me an interview. I don't need a trip to Washington. Uh, tell him I totally understand. I don't know what happened, but that's fine. And the man said, no, Mr. Fister wants to see you. Oh, well, I said, it's feeling like, you know, this is just a courtesy. I said, well, look, I'm on vacation. I couldn't do this for th about three weeks from now, the end of June. And, he, and the man said, well, that'll be just fine. That'll work out just fine. I said, okay. So I went to Washington. I had my interview. It was right after lunch, about 2 o'clock, and Ed Fister uh, really dozed a couple of times while I was talking. And all the time I was sitting there thinking, <laughs> I'm not going to get this job. You know, I have just put this man to sleep. I, I know what it's like after lunch myself sometimes, but still, I remember leaving the office and going to the phone and calling my wife and saying, <laughs> don't worry about Washington. The man fell asleep. Uh, she said, well, you know, forget about it. Go see Jack and Mary, some friends of ours, and then come home. And I said, well, I'll be there. And then... It was about, I think, 
first of August. I didn't hear anything, and then I was done. I was a consultant down in, uh, oh, that wonderful city, Louisville, Kentucky. And the phone, the secretary said, my secretary called, and she said, CPB is trying to get a hold of you, Ron. You're supposed to call this man. And it was the personnel office. And I said, well, did you tell them where I am? And she said, well, I did. And I said, if they want me, they'll call. And I didn't call them. Well, they called. And they said, um, oh, Mr. Hull, uh, Mr. Fister wants to see you again. And I said, well, I can't believe this. Why? And he said, well, he, he wants to interview you again. So, oh, dear. So I said, well, all right. So I went back to Washington. And this time, he had his assistant, Walda Roseman, a wonderful woman, was in the room with us. It was Ed and Walda and me. And this time, everything just went swimmingly. I thought, now this is an interview, you know, and I felt really good about it. So when I left the office, I went and I called my wife and I said, this for sure I won't get. Remember the last time, they all fell asleep and they asked me to come back. This time, it went great. I said, we will not hear from these people again. Well, um, I, at the end of August, my mother and father, my father's gone now, but my mother still lives in Rapid City, South Dakota. And I go up there about every three months. And I was up there visiting them, and the phone rang. And it was Ed Fister. And this was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a, I think a Friday. And he said, Ron, you have to get to Washington immediately. Uh, the board wants to meet the candidates, and there are three candidates, and you're one of them. Now you must get to Washington. And I said, Ed, I'm in Rapid City, South Dakota. There's like one plane in, in the morning and one out in the afternoon. I'm sure it's gone. And he said, you get to Washington. So I called the airlines, and by us, there was a plane to Denver, about 5.30 in a couple of hours. The only way I could get to Washington, I can't, I don't know why, it doesn't seem now why this would be, but was to wait in Denver till about midnight and take the red eye from Denver to Atlanta and from Atlanta up to Washington, which I did. And I arrived having had no sleep at uh, about 6.30 in the morning or 7.00. No, it was about 8, because I called the office and Ed was there, and I said, okay, I'm in town, I'm at the airport, I've had no sleep, I have to have a shower, and they've got these 25-cent showers out at the airport. He said, we have a shower at CPB. I said, soap and towels? And he said, we have it all. I said, well, okay, I'll come in. And I got there, but the problem was my clothes, because I had cowboy boots, and my jean jacket and jeans, that's what I wear in South Dakota. And that's all I had. And he said, now you have to meet the board. And I thought, well, this, this nothing's going to come of this. They're going to really wonder what hit them. Because I was very tired, too. But I walked in, and there's the board. And Les Cowan, the president of Walmart, uh, Gillian Sorensen, Ted Sorensen's wife, was on the board then. Uh, actress Kathleen Nolan was at the table, who's a very close friend to this day. Uh, Sharon Rockefeller was the chairman of the chairperson of the board, and she said, uh, "This is how it's going to work, Mr. Hull. Uh, you've got an hour. We're going to we we'll sit down, please." And I said, "If you don't mind, if I if I stay standing, there's big chairs, and I said, if I sit down, I'll fall asleep on right in front of everybody." She said, "Well, okay, stand." But she said, you've got half an hour. Start any place. Tell us about yourself. Just talk. Just tell us what you want us to know. And then the second half hour is ours. And we will ask the questions. And I said, well, fine. And I talked for half an hour. And then they asked their questions. And uh, they thanked me. And they walked out. And it was noon. And uh, they had a driver and a car uh, to take me to the airport which I thought was real classy. And they delivered me to the airport, and I got on the plane, and I got back to Rapid City that night about 
6.30 p.m., something like that. I was absolutely dead. Been up for 40 hours by then. And I went to bed. And the phone rang. And my mother came in the bedroom, and she said, it's for you. And I went to the phone. It was Ed Fister, and he said, uh, you've been elected the director of the program fund. And you couldn't believe it. But when I started at the beginning, don't care if you get the job. <laughs> Just you know, Then you are being yourself. You are being very honest. You don't have any agendas about what will this sound like or what will that sound like or what will they think of me. You, you don't think about yourself at all because you don't care. You know, I was perfectly happy in Nebraska. And if I would stay in Nebraska, that's just fine with me. And that's, if you can do that, it works. You know? But a lot of times we can't because we really want that job. That wasn't that, wasn't that true for me. I, I, I would like to have had it. I knew that. But I thought it was such a long shot that I never let myself think that that was really much of a possibility. And you know, it's funny, one of the fellows that was the, one of the candidates that day, absolutely brilliant, wonderful man named Gene Cott, he was my deputy at CPB. He was a deputy program fund director. I've learned, I think I learned more from him than almost anybody in terms of strategy, in terms of what works on television, programming. He, he just has this wonderful mind, and, and he just understands everything about how things work together. I, I just was his student all that time, and he actually reported to me, but one day he told me, he said, you know, you didn't know this, but the day you came to CPB for your interview, he said, I'd just gotten off the metro, and I was across the street on the corner, and I saw you get out of the cab, and I saw you run to the steps, I saw you run up the steps of CPB, and in the building... And I said to myself, that's the guy that's going to get it. All that energy, they're going to like that energy, <laughs> you know. And um, on that one, he was right. But he, he is one of my closest friends. Talk, talk about what it was to, to do that job during those years. Well, as Bill Moyers said, Ron, you're in the cauldron, and you are. We used to sit around the office and figure, what is the level of money that people would kill you for, do you think? <laughs> and we finally decided that it wasn't a whole lot. <laughs> Maybe 25000 bucks. you know, you're out. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience because of, I got to know the whole producing community in America. The independents, the station people, those are the people that came in the door with their proposals in hand that I would read, my staff would read, we would discuss, evaluate, I would decide, you get it, you don't, you do. We, we paneled, uh, used panels for some of our decisions too, but the biggest decisions like creating the Outreach Alliance, like creating uh, American Experience, those were unilateral individual uh, decisions that didn't go through panels or anything else. Because we could do it that way then, we, that doesn't work now. But it was the stimulation of being around uh, the Mickey Lemleys and the, and the Judy Crichtons. And, uh, what about the issue of political influence from, from uh, well, it was always legislators? It was always there. Uh, of, of somebody always trying to put the heavy hand on mm. you. Mean. Well, when I first took the job, <clears throat> Lewis Friedman had that job for two and a half years. But when Mr. Fister came in as president, six months before Lewis left, this autonomy had been eroded. Ed Fister wanted to have more control over programming himself as president. And the board, you know, how they have love affairs with the first six months is a love affair with their new executive. And so they changed, changed it so that uh, the program fund director had to report to the president and discuss the, the uh, issues with him. Well, if you have a large sum of money like that, it can only be managed by one person. You can't have two people or three people say, well, you'll get this and you'll get that. It just doesn't work. You've got to have a central point. And there were times when I'd come back to the office and find out Ed had promised somebody $250,000, never even asking if we even had $250,000. You know, That wasn't working. And the fact of it is, I came there in, uh, I guess it was the 1st of September, 1982, and this pertained that, <clears throat> that, that he was overseeing those program decisions until the board meeting of May 1983. In the meantime, Kathleen Nolan, 
a Democrat, and by that time we were good friends, came to me and said, this isn't working so well, is it? Having to go through Ed and, and it's not working as well as it was when Lewis simply made the decisions with the advice of his staff and others. And, and I had to be honest and I said, no, it, it's not working well. And so they drafted a resolution, they being Les Cowan, also a Democrat, Kathleen Nolan, Democrat, and they took the most conservative Republican on the board, a woman named Sonia Landau. But she saw the wisdom of this too and wasn't that crazy about Ed Fister, whom she later got rid of. The three of them submitted this proposal to give back to the program fund director the authority to make unilateral financial decisions to depoliticize the process because the president reported directly to the board. <clears throat> they did that. They passed that at that meeting and um, from that time on, Ed Fester, I don't, he hasn't said more than three words to me in the ensuing years. He was so angry and uh, I just felt it was the right thing to do and I was sorry that he felt the way that he did and I still feel it was the right thing to do. Hmm. But that situation kept that process uh, less political than it might have been. What would be some examples of, um, of political interests uh, being well, directed towards somebody in that, in that particular kind of job? A couple times I would get, oh, more than a couple times, people in Congress would write and say, Mr. So-and-so is a very fine producer and I would look with great favor upon your uh, seeing the merit of his proposal or her proposal. That would happen. When Sonia Landau took over, uh, she was a very political person, having headed uh, women for Reagan and Bush. That was her job. And now she was my board chair. And for example, I remember one time uh, in New York, and, and I saw her a lot, and she used to like to have me introduce her to all the community of public broadcasting. And, and, uh, and maybe you remember Alan and Susan Raymond. They did the Loud film in uh, Santa Barbara, the family that disintegrated before our eyes. And they did uh, police tapes, which was a, a wonderful. They're good producers, very good producers. And I saw them standing at this party, and I thought, oh, Miss Landau should meet them. So I took her over and I said, Miss Landau, I know you would like to meet Alan and Susan Raymond, or Susan and Alan Raymond. And she was very cordial. And Alan, who is a, is a, is a wonderful guy, but kind of outspoken about some things, and her husband at the time was John Corey, the uh, New York Times television critic. And Alan looked at her and he said, uh, well, it's nice to meet you, Miss Landau. What does your husband have against public television? <sighs> she was Nothing. He loves public television. Well, he still doesn't write about it that way. And she pulled me away and she said, do they, do they have a proposal in, those two? And they did. They had a proposal in called Big City Cops, 500, 000, uh, 450,000 bucks. And I, and I said, well, yes, they do. And she said, dump them. Dump them, dump them, dump them. And I thought at the time, you know, I can't dump them. And I went back to the office the next day or so and sat down with the staff and I told them all what happened and we all said, you know, you have nothing if you don't have integrity. Nothing. And we, so I said, so what should we do? And everybody goes, fund it, fund it, fund it. <laughs> you know? And we funded it. We put the press release out, Big City Cops, Al and Susan Raymond production, da 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 da. And to San uh, Landau's credit, she never, <laughs> she never questioned me on it. And she let it go, you know. But the biggest problem of uh, there were, well, there were always political pressures. So there's whenever there's that kind of money involved. Well, I, I got my little tail in a jam over. Um, we were doing a show called uh, uh, Paul Duke was doing it. It was from Capitol Hill or something. It had to do with uh, the lawmakers. It was called the lawmakers. <clears throat> and that was costing us $2 million a year. Cokie Roberts was on it. Uh, wonderful people were on it. But about half the stations weren't carrying it. They found it boring. It was a studio show. It, you know, no footage from the Hill. It, and the, it would, I just felt we were wasting our money. So I killed it. 
and no sooner killed it, realized that CPB had to have some coverage of Congress. Just had to have. But I almost lost my job over that because uh, some of the bigger guns in public broadcasting said that by killing that show, I had cost them, I think they said, $12 million on the Hill of people that, that, that cut back on our appropriations because they were so unhappy with that decision. Uh, I'll tell you one way Washington works. I, uh, Larry Grossman, who was the, was the president of PBS, and uh, he was leaving to become the president of NBC News, and Sue Weil, the program person at PBS, had a dinner party for him, uh, a luncheon actually, for about 24 people. And I had written the letter to Ward Chamberlain at WTA saying we were no longer going to fund the lawmakers. And I knew I was going to bring the roof down on my head, so I wanted to have a weekend where I wouldn't be bothered, so I didn't mail it until late Friday, assuming he'd get it sun, uh, Monday. I was sitting next to Captain Airwaves of the Post, Jack uh, Carmody. Jack Carmody is a wonderful man, wonderful writer, and he's Captain Airwaves. He has a column in the Washington Post every day. And if you get in his column, you know, it's really big time. And he was a great man, and I was sitting next to him, and he said to me, I have to remember, CPB shared an alley with the Washington Post. The Post was right behind us. And Jack turned to me and he said, uh, boy, that was quite a memo you sent to Ward. And I looked at him and I said, just, just a minute. And I went over to Ward and I said, Ward, I wrote you a memo about the lawmakers. Have you seen that yet? And Ward said, no. I said, you didn't get your mail on Saturday or something. And he said, nope. I went back. And I looked at Carmody and I said, well, I guess the distance across the alley is shorter than, you know, and I had a mole in there who had shipped that stuff over. And that's one of the things you contended with, uh, too. You never knew who you could trust uh, in some respects. I, and I want to say a blanket statement like that because I'd have to tell you the five people I worked closest with, Gene Cott and Jennifer Lawson, who was later the head of programming at PBS, Don Marbury, who's uh, head of programming at CPB now, and Pat King, uh, the most efficient woman I've ever worked with in my life, I guess. Uh, those people are still, we just bonded, we're so close, and they were people I could trust. They didn't squeal on me, I don't know who did, but somebody did, but there was, a, a, there was always this back and forth uh, with Congress, too. But by and large, I think we've been successful in holding back, both here in the state and at the federal level, holding back undue influence from government, which has always been a fear ever since government got into broadcasting. We've always worried about that. But you know, I worry a whole lot more now about the fact that only 14 large companies own telecommunications in America. And the fact that uh, the same man who produces the Fox programs also owns TV Guide and can hype his own shows, for example, or the people that own Time Warner can decide what the reviews are going to be like. Not that they will, but, the, but that possibility exists. It's the same, it seems to me it's the same thing. And to me, money always speaks, speaks so loudly that that's something for each of us as citizens to be very vigilant about. Because that number 14, I think, is going to diminish down smaller and smaller, which to me is confirms one of the primary reasons we have public broadcasting, that <clears throat> with these big conglomerates owning everything, the commercial stations concentrate on local news, but that's about all. Nobody does the great documentaries anymore except public television, and nobody does the local, local, local service that public television does. That, to me, is, becomes more important uh, for our role in America is serving the people of Nebraska in their own way, with their own forum, their own town hall, their own communications enterprise. What brought you back to Nebraska after having the experience in <clears throat> Washington? Actually, I was ready to come back uh, two years before I came back here. Not everything works out exactly the way you want. Uh, uh, that, uh, because it's there that I'm indebted very much to Jack. I had my time in Washington 
and I really wanted to come back to Nebraska. You see, one thing, my family was here, and I commuted back to, on weekends from Washington. And, then, and uh, I did that for six years, and that's a long time to commute. But I tell you one thing that's interesting. You'd be surprised how many people in this country have commuter marriages and commuter jobs. I used to go to National Airport and catch the 5 o'clock plane to Lincoln, and there were five of us that I would see every Friday night. There were me, three other men, and a woman. Now, those four people all went to Chicago. They happened, they were all lawyers, but they all had families in Chicago. They had jobs that were nice jobs in Washington, but maybe not that permanent, you know. They weren't willing to uproot everybody, bring them here. Or they had grandparents that their kids were important to. Now, the woman, she, her husband, she and her husband would drive to O'Hare in Chicago Monday mornings. He would fly to New York and she would fly to Washington. And then they'd take the shuttle back and forth from Washington to New York, maybe once during the week. And then they would meet back at O'Hare on Friday nights and go back. I mean, there's people living lifestyles like that. Well, I was in that for a long time, and six years is quite enough. But actually, see, I was ready to leave uh, at the end of the fourth year. I, I felt that I was really hankering to get back home. And Jack had some plans that were excellent. It was going to take some new funding, and he wanted to create a position uh, along with those plans of a station manager position that we've never had. Somebody to manage the production units uh, with the program manager, of course, but the station, K-U-O-N. And uh, he had the funding in place. It, w uh, it was... Um, I mean, it was almost a sure thing. It was the um, the Kiewit Foundation was very interested in what he had in mind, and then the thing that uh, negated that grant at that time was that they uh, had just given a, a lot of money for the development of the lead center. And the lead center got priority over over us at that time, and. He, he didn't get it, and he couldn't afford to bring me back. And so I just thought, well, I just hunker down here, and we'll just have to take this and see how it goes. And uh, it took two years then before he was able to get things in place to manage this way he wanted to. Vance Rogers played a role in that. And uh, Vance saw me as the person to come back and uh, follow in Jack's footsteps. So whenever Jack would retire, I'd be the second person there to move up into that position, and, and that appealed to me a lot. To, and, you know, you can't be presumptuous about something like that. I mean, all kinds of things happen, and committees and all the rest, but that was the intent at that time. And I was very, very happily came back, and I love Washington, and I wouldn't, give, I wouldn't give up a minute I had there, but uh, I really, I, this is where I belong here. I, I mean, for my own well-being, this is where I belong, Nebraska. Talk a little bit about uh, Nebraska Public Television since you've come back in, in, the, in the current period. What, what kinds of things are different now than they were before you went to Washington? The, the best asset we have are the, are the professionals that we have in this building. And that, the quality of those people, the opportunities they've had for experience and therefore have honed their abilities, uh, has increased enormously. Uh, we have producers in this building now that are as good as any people working in the United States. Absolutely. And if you start mentioning them, you leave somebody out, you're always in trouble. But I'm talking about brilliant people. Talk about now a little bit also about some of the people on the the ETV commission over the years that have been folks. You who don't want to tell them tell, tell about the producers, <laughs> okay? If you wish, you but. Can. but but we have about uh, 10 minutes or so to oh, go that's at all this we point, have? and I, I want you to address Well, let me say this. Right? I've worked with a number of boards now. I've worked with uh, politically appointed, politicized boards where, you know, I, I think the world of Sharon Rockefeller, and I've gotten to know her over the last 15 years at some rather uh, deep levels in some ways. Uh, when you're there, when certain things happen, you get to know people. She's wonderful. But she's also a person that no one ever says no to Mrs. Rockefeller. How are you going to say no to Sharon Rockefeller? Nobody has ever said no. You know, I can't imagine what it's like to live your life where whatever your idea is, it's a great idea. Uh, 
It, but that's if you're a Rockefeller and, and you you have that kind of power, and her husband's a senator, I think. And her father was a senator. And her father was a wonderful senator. In fact, I Charles Percy. I just saw him at her house at a party she had uh, well, a couple months ago. Yeah, Charles Percy, she's doing well. But our commission have always been appointed by the governor. There are certain people on the commission that are there by virtue of who they are, the um, um, State Department of Education commissioner is always on that board. Uh, who else is somebody that's there the because of who they are? The representative of the university system. That's right. The, those are the two. The rest are appointed to, to represent the congressional districts, the various school class um, divisions, and uh, we have had the most wonderful commissioners. We've never had a bad commission. They've been positive. I mean, they. it didn't matter what political party they come from. They have from the beginning. I mean, since Governor Morrison signed the ETV network into law, a Democrat followed by Jim Exxon, I think, followed by Nobby Tiemann. Uh, one of the people that helped us the most was uh, Republican Kay Orr. I mean, these people, and then the people they appointed, have been the backbone of what we've done, and there have been wonderful people on there. I mentioned George Curtis, one of the great men. Uh, I guess he wasn't on the commission, but it seemed like he was. He did so much for us. But we've had, we've had many of the very uh, finest commercial broadcasters on there. We've had people from the state colleges. We've had from the University of Nebraska Kearney. Right now, Sam Rankin from Shadron is on that board. We've had both men and women. and. Uh, they have, in my view, have always bought into what I think is the right concept, and that is that they set policy. They set the policy. They don't make those individual program decisions. They don't make the individual hiring decisions. They simply set the framework under which Jack McBride and then the people under him operate. And if they're unhappy with that, they have ways of changing that. But they've always stayed up here where they should be. And they've let the staff manage things that are appropriately staffed. And that, to me, it sounds very simple, but it's very key, and it's something that so many boards don't do. Some people will refer to the, um, the network as a unifying element in the state. I think how, so. How do, you, how do you see that? I think that this network has changed the way the people of Nebraska look at themselves and look at their state. And I think it speaks to what you're saying. I think that the first time John Nyhart came in our door and that mellifluous voice with those poems struck a chord right in the people's hearts. And all the programs we did with Sandoz and all of the history programs that we've done, the ones about Mar Mar uh, Willa Cather, and there are lots of others uh, that, that are equally strong, but over time, I believe that this network did what I said. It has changed the way Nebraskans look at themselves and therefore look at their environment and look at their, at their lot in life and the pride that they have in it. It's a very unifying force in the state. It's been very constructive in building the state. It's been very important economically to the state. Why is public television so successful in Nebraska as compared to other states where it's not a statewide network and it's a spotty situation where one station is successful and not others? I think that goes back to leadership because you find success in the most unlikely places sometimes and then you have to look at the leadership. I mean, it's just like you know, you're know, you going to find genius in a ghetto as quickly as you're going to find it in uh, Upper East 86th Street. But I, to me that's a leadership question. Uh, you look at the places that are really uh, powerful and strong in public television uh, first of all, the state network is probably the most uh, successful model for the whole, the whole, because you start every year about 50% funded. The people that run the community stations start every year at zero budgeting, and then they have to raise everything. That's a big difference. Our people know that they've got their salaries, they've got their equipment, that's all that's underwritten. But you think of South Carolina with the Henry Cawthon, you think of uh, Kentucky, uh, Land Press, you think of Jack McBride in Nebraska. These were broadcasting pioneers that had vision and built these enterprises. Now, there are very successful 
uh, stations in very large communities, and then there are a lot of large communities that don't have successful stations, and I think it's just been because they haven't had the, the leadership to, to build it. You mentioned, of course, uh, the Jack O'Brien was here when you came here, and you mentioned several other people who are still active members of the, of the staff who have been here at the uh, same time that you have and perhaps have come and gone and so forth. Why, why is there stability here? Why, why is there a situation in which people are willing to keep, uh, keep going? One of the reasons is that all of us here had an opportunity to grow. When I came here, I was the fifth person hired. Uh, two years later, we had 22 people, and three years later, we had 36 people. This place is not the same place. This place has evolved and changed and met the needs of the time and changed again, and it's evolving right now. It's changing right now. The whole world is changing, as you know, not just telecommunications, but everybody's life is changing in the world now. But I feel that there were opportunities to grow, and everybody was stimulated by that growth. I also think there's some very peculiar things about being a Nebraskan. I think that most of us identify being Nebraskans in a way that Californians don't or New Yorkers don't. People that live in New York City do somewhat. They're New Yorkers, you know. But you go to North Carolina, part of the reason is that we've always had one central university that everybody identified with, one football team everybody identified with. That didn't change. We were smart when we built the ETV network to have, have the center here in Lincoln and then spread out across the state. South Dakota had a studio in Brookings, had one in Vermilion, and then that just sort of proliferates everything. They've changed that now, but we started out strong because of that. I feel that Nebraskans are, I think, I feel they are a singular people. <coughs> um, I don't know of any other state, for example, that has three literary centers. You know, we have a lot going. The Willa Cather's Center down in Red Cloud. And you go to the Nyhart Center in Bancroft. And we're building the old library on Shadron State campus is now becoming the Mari Sandoz Heritage Center, uh, High Plains Heritage Center, Mari Sandals High Plains Heritage Center. Now these are pe people that did this, are the cattlemen and the farmers and the rest of us in this state that uh, if they see a good idea they'll latch onto it. Why do we have an ETV network? Because of the particular people in a small populated state who understood the wisdom of having it. Why do we have that magnificent Capitol building? built brick by brick and everyone paid for it before it was laid, you know. It's, it's part of the character and the nature of the people of Nebraska, I think. And it's uh, something to be very proud of. Well, we're coming pretty close to the end of the time. We have a few more minutes. Uh, what, uh, what have I not asked you about that uh, occurs to you that might be something that you would, would like to bring up? Well, I guess I would have to say there are two people that played very important roles here at ETV. The first one, Esther Montgomery. Uh, she taught for us for 10 years on television. She's the most wonderful <laughs> uh, woman in the world, uh, one of the smartest people that I've ever met. <coughs> Excuse me, she, she became a research person for us, ran our library, she gave us all her books, it became the library. We built a room for her when the building was built, Esther's Attic, you know all about it. Uh, just a, a, a wonderful woman who nurtured human spirit, who recognized intelligence, recognized talent, and there wasn't a person here that didn't love her. And she was very, very pivotal. I'll tell you one story about her. When we moved to this building, the concession people said that we could no longer have what they called wildcat coffee pots. In downtown, when we were in all those old houses, everybody had a coffee pot. They said, we make our money off the coffee machine, they're going to have to buy money. You cannot have wildcat coffee pots around the building. Well, Esther always had tea and coffee, and she was the mother superior and the cry on my shoulder person, so she needed those things. But I sent a memo out, and it said, to all 200 people, it said, you know, there will be no more wildcat coffee pots in the building. We have to support the concessions. And she sent out a memo to all 200 people that said, well, I've been called a bitch and a whore, but I've never been called a wildcat before. And we let her keep her coffee pot, <laughs> her teapot. <coughs> the other, I love her, still do. 
Uh, she's, she's been gone now about four years. Um, the other person that had a, an indelible mark on us was a man named Marshall Jameson that had uh, produced and directed the U.S. Steel Hour and had, done, had directed Broadway plays, brought a, uh, a standard of, and a, of excellence, certainly, but a level of experience that was uncommon for us. At, and we put him to work here, and I, I felt that just having him in the midst of our people raised, uh, raised people's sights. Uh, everybody liked him the way they liked Esther. And if Marshall said, well, let's try it this way, we tried it this way. And if Marshall said this will work, they knew it would work, or this is how this should look, or that. And this building is filled with people who learn and learn and learn from this remarkably patient, kind, affable, wonderful man that had his... I, he's, I still go to him for nurture. You know, he's in retirement now in Florida. But there's people like that that the rest of us uh, grew from and learned from so much. And I wouldn't want to talk about ETV without mentioning the two of them. Ron, thanks very much. I'm sure we could uh, My pleasure. do this again and get some more information, <laughs> but you've done a lot today. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Larry.